What is it, Alan? I don't really care. I ask anyway. I'm busy. I don't have time to waste on those idiots. The entire lawsuit is frivolous, just trying to strong-arm us into saying we did something wrong when we followed the law. Go complain to some congressman about the law not being enough. We're certainly not giving you any money. Lawyers are here to talk about the Paxton case. Ugh, I knew it. I know, it doesn't have a chance in court, but we still need to be at the meeting or it starts to look bad. Right. I check my blouse for wrinkles and coffee stains for the eighth time today and head out of my office to join Alan. He gives me a kiss on the cheek. It's sweet, comforting, calming, even. Remember, we promise nothing, I remind him. I know, I know. We've talked about this. Okay. Liz? Alan stops walking, and I stop too. What? He looks me in the eye, his gaze unyielding in its intensity. I've got your back, he says, and I believe him. Okay. That was what I fell for once upon a time. His intensity. Let's do this. We walk into the conference room together. And the number of interesting people in the room climbs to four as we enter, with Alan and I being the only two worth anything. Me, Alan, Alexis, Patricia. Alexis Gord, the Paxton family lawyer. Specialty, class action, young, pretty. He somehow manages to pull off boyishly handsome and in control at the same time. I've worked opposite him before. He's a schmuck. Patricia, though, Patricia is worse. Perpetually crying, perpetually blaming everyone but the ones responsible for her son's death, the lobbyists that pushed for lower environmental regulations, and the politicians that cared more about money than anything else. At least she has the drive to do something about it. She might even be one of those elusive few capable of affecting real change. If only she was smart enough to actually make a difference where it counts. The other half dozen people in this room are figures I've accounted for. The brother, too emotional to raise his voice. The father, too afraid of saying the wrong thing and ruining his family's chances. The board members that insist upon coming to these things due to some misguided sense of duty or the cautious desire to know everything with the smallest potential of starting a PR problem. And the secretary, recording the minutes at the corner of the table. They're like wallpaper, coloring the room while the rest of the real people do the real talking. I'm bored. Hello again, Miss Hubbard, Mr. Antimony, Alexis says through his practiced, dazzling smile as we walk in. I can almost feel the headache already. Mr. Gord, shall we get right down to business? If you insist. I sit down across from Gord, and Alan sits to my immediate left. Since your factor has come into place, the amount of asthma cases in children in the county have risen by 27.3%. Strange, considering we're following all of the guidelines set by the EPA, with a generous margin of error on our own part. And strange indeed. But wouldn't it be potentially extremely damaging to your corporate reputation if you suddenly stopped being seen as philanthropic lifesavers and job creators and instead became known as the corporate scumbags that were polluting the area? I'm sure your stockholders wouldn't be too happy about that. Alexis trails off, spinning his pen absent-mindedly around the thumb of his hand. That looks like it takes practice. Could have spent his time being a better lawyer, but instead he learned how to spin a pen around his thumb. Hypothetically, of course. Naturally. I think I might find that hypothetical event particularly libelous. Ah, uh, yes, Miss Hubbard, but if I remember my years in law school correctly, truth is an absolute defense of libel. He flashes that stupid smile again. Schmuck. Assuming the libelous statements can be proven truthful. I do my best to lock his stupid smile with one of my own, but I don't think he really grasps my intention. I don't care enough to push the subject which in this case would require that you be capable of proving that the HubTech facility is in fact not meeting the EPA requirements, which would naturally be impossible. Naturally. 
So you recognize that this hypothetical situation would be a complete waste of the time and money of both you and your clients, which would inevitably lead to lawsuits. Oh, of course. But I also think it would be a waste of your time and money. That is the very definition of libel. I haven't said a thing about you or your company, Miss Hubbard. I'm simply raising a potential health concern to your attention. Again, with the stupid smile. Schmuck. And so you're hoping to strong-arm us into a settlement with talk of hypotheticals, which I'm sure could only hypothetically be constructed as a direct threat. Oh, I'd hardly attempt that. I'm just a bit of a dreamer. I like to look at the future and see what we can possibly do to affect change. I'm going to punch him. What do you want? Alan says, finally joining the meeting now that Alexis has said his piece. Alan was always better at compromises than me anyway, and from the sound of this, we're going to need one. His clients are desperate, and he's willing to take advantage of that desperation to start a court battle he knows he'll lose. After all, even if his client runs out of money, he'll still be all the richer. I'm sure interrupting my business is just icing to him. He never did like me. The feeling is quite mutual. Five million for damages and a promise to update your factory beyond the EPA guidelines. I laugh. I can't help it. His demands are just too ridiculous. Patricia Paxton starts crying. Great. I really missed that. Absolutely not. Alexis' smile drops, and his face turns into what I think is supposed to be a frightening degree of seriousness, contrasting his earlier exaggerated charm. Can you really not let go of your pride for one day? Children are dying. Children die every day. You're a monster, Patricia whimpers between sniffles. You're the one asking me to temporarily remove the only affordable generic source of epinephrine auto-injectors from the market, potentially causing the deaths of hundreds of children who can't afford other care and are unlucky enough to get stung by a bee while they're not operating. Don't preach to me about protecting the children when you're the one asking for me to stand by as they suffer anaphylaxis. Alexis stands up, buttoning his suit jacket, his smile replaced with a thin line. He knows that he's not going to get anywhere with me, and that things will only get worse the longer Patricia Paxton is sitting here crying in my general direction. He may be a schmuck, but he's smart enough to know when he's not going to win. I suppose we'll have to see what hypotheticals become reality, then. I suppose we will. I smile at him as obnoxiously as I can as he leaves. Through his self-serious veneer, I think he might have finally realized that I've been mocking him for the duration of this relatively short meeting. That did not go well, Alan whispers to me, pulling me out of the room. I hate them. They're going to drag your name through the mud. I'd like to see them try. Alan cocks an eyebrow. I have a press conference scheduled for an hour from now. Attacking them publicly, Alan interrupts. I hate when he interrupts, but he needs one. Won't work. Yes, I'm not stupid. But announcing that their problem has come to our attention and we're going to take the initiative by renovating that factory to be as environmentally friendly as possible, taking their problem and turning it into a positive PR stunt without admitting culpability and hemorrhaging money through a settlement, a net gain in every department. Were you going to share this idea with me at any point? It's fairly young, as ideas go. You interrupted me to bring me to the meeting while I was writing the speech. Alan rolls his eyes. God forbid anyone help you. I smile. Easier when I'm not worrying about anyone else. I'm awake. I'm alive. I'm losing my mind, wrapped up in blankets, and covered in sweat. It's like I'm awake, but part of me is still dreaming. I can see the numbers of my alarm clock slowly ticking upward, but I can also feel myself swimming in a pool full of jello as cotton candy floats around me. Not metaphorically, I can literally see it like it's in the corner of my vision and somehow not at the same time. Am I hallucinating? Delirious? I get dressed quickly. I need to run. The jello and the cotton candy fade away in an instant. In the bed, Alan groans. What are you doing up? What are you doing up? 
The words come only a fraction of a second before the thought enters my head. Perfectly identical. What's going on? Nightmare, I think. Don't worry about me. I hate when she says that. Okay? Okay? What the hell? Why is he saying the things that I'm thinking? Or am I thinking the things he's saying? Or have I just lost my mind? Think of a number. As soon as I say it, I focus on the number 26, holding the number in my head. But I can only hold it for a moment before an intrusive thought rushes into my head. A different number. Four. Four. She knows me so well. I pinch myself. I'm still here. I'm not dreaming. I pinch harder. I have to be dreaming. None of this makes any sense. I'll be back in a bit. Love you. He groans, mumbling something I can't quite catch. But some part of me is absolutely sure that he was telling me that he loves me. I rush outside and put on my running shoes. Nightmares aren't new. Dr. Fetz recommended running when they showed up. A positive outlet to wake me up, tire me out, and refocus my mind on something productive. It helped. Right now, it is different. That feeling of delirium might be gone, but I'm still hearing things in my head before Alan says them out loud. I shouldn't be able to know what he's going to say a moment before he says it. I shouldn't be able to know what number he picked. None of this makes any sense. I want to wake up, but I'm still here. I go out the door and start running. It's way too late. I need to go home. $2.49. One penny to spare. Suits her right. What the hell is in my head? We, uh... I stop running. Hell, I stop breathing. Before, my intrusive thoughts were predicting what Alan was going to say, but now they're talking to me? Or was that just a coincidence? Who are you? Max. Daniel. Pat. Where are you? I'm the cashier in the department store across the street. I'm the man in the department store across the street. I'm the woman in the department store across the street. What? There's no response. Can you hear me? Yes. I head across the street and into the store. It's more of a glorified gas station than anything else. Why are you in my head? We don't know. I put them there. I see the cashier first, counting up the small change the guy's handing him for a drink at a candy bar. The woman is in the back, looking at the soda. How did you put them in my head? I cursed you, so that you would always know the terrible things that others thought about you. What? Cursed me? Now, I've heard about the magic wind guy, but curses? Curses aren't real. I'm not a sorcerer. I was given the power to exact my vengeance by Sathanus in exchange for my life. I'm three feet away from the woman when I finally recognize her. Patricia Paxton, the girl who wouldn't stop crying. She's not crying now. Patricia turns around and looks me straight in the eye, her jaw set in what I'd almost call a smile if it weren't overflowing with so much bitterness and venom. You ruined my life. You killed my son, took away my only happiness. Now I will take away all of yours. You ruined my life. You killed my son, took away my only happiness. Now I will take away all of yours. Patricia slumps against the wall of sodas and smiles for the first time I've seen. Go to hell. Go. She doesn't have time to finish the sentence. Her eyes glaze over and she collapses onto the ground. I turn around immediately and walk out of the store and run back home as quickly and calmly as I can after watching a woman die. This isn't real. This isn't real. Curses aren't real. I take a cold shower. It doesn't help. Liz, are you okay? Liz, are you okay? Why? You look sick. Honestly? 
She's upset. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Stress. It's not stress. She knows. Act casual. You know me so well. You know me so well. What? She knows. What do you think I know? I'm cheating on you with Alexis Gord. I slam my head onto my desk. It doesn't hurt that much. Everything's going numb. Liz, are you okay? How long have you been seeing him? God damn it. Who? Who? Alexis. Two months. Too long. A month. A month. Stop lying to me. Two months. Two months. Get out. Damn it. Liz, it's not like that. I'm not just playing. Liz, it's not. Get out. Alan leaves. He shuts the door behind him. I cry as I fill in his notice of termination. I don't even care anymore. Maybe he'll see the watermarks on the paper and realize how badly he screwed up. For the reasons for his termination, I make sure to mark dishonesty, incompetence, and overly frequent absences. It doesn't make me feel much better. She looks awful. Is she sick? Yet another surprise meeting from our glorious leader. What is this about? I'd like to announce my resignation. What? She has to be kidding. Miss Hubbard, this is your company. Miss Hubbard, this is your company, Mr. Huckabee says. The one member of the board that was always in my corner, that trusted me to handle that which I had created. He looks betrayed. I try not to notice. Yes, it is. And it is in good hands. What is she talking about? She built this company. Who could we replace her with? Why? I've been feeling under the weather recently. Of course you have. What a liar. I've recently been diagnosed with a serious personality disorder. I lie. And that explains a lot. And as much as I hate to say it, I'm supposed to be done crying. I've cried for most of today. I don't think I can properly do my job anymore, so I'm resigning as CEO. This is not going to go well. Good riddance. All this immediately after her press conference? What is she thinking? I'll be holding on to my assets, but I need to not be here right now. Then leave. I do. So you're this commander I've been hearing about. So you're this commander I've been hearing about. Ton sounds just as impressive in a dark alley as he does on TV. That has to be a trick. How do you make your voice sound like that? I speak softly and perpetuate the vibrations in the air so that the sound carries further. Naturally. You've been quite a bit of help to us recently. You've been quite a bit of help to us recently. What do you mean? You've been organizing heroes over the last few weeks to great effect. I have a history in management. Ton cocks an eyebrow, but doesn't respond. I have a proposition for you. I have a proposition for you. What is it? I'm trying to establish a dedicated group of heroes that others can rally around, and I'd like you to be part of it. I'm not interested. Both of his eyebrows raise, and he crosses his arms, his almost ceremonial clothes billowing behind him in the perpetual breeze that seems to constantly surround the living tornado. Why? Why? Why do you want me? I think you would be genuinely helpful. You've been doing hard work, and I'm trying to make sure we have a group of people with vastly different capabilities working together. Why? To help. To inspire others to help. 
I'm not really the best team player. It's true. Too many people around, and I have trouble thinking at all. Everything gets overwhelming, and I lose track of what thoughts are mine, let alone everyone else's. And that's ignoring the fact that I know all the terrible things my coworkers think of me. Hell, I've been working almost exclusively online just to get away from people, so I don't have to deal with that. I don't need to break again. Who else is on the team? Avalanche, Railgun, the Librarian, and me. Some of the biggest names around. I'm supposed to keep up with all of you. I think you will. I'm willing to put that to the test. I'm willing to put that to the test. Would you be taking the team for a test run or making everything public and official right at the start? The former. Fine. But only for this test run of yours. I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. The librarian said that we didn't have much to worry about because Kaboom's power was to ignore sudden changes in the world around him. If Avalanche tried to smash him, the supervillain would be fine. But if he instead picked him up slowly, we would be all right. We were not all right. Fitting his namesake, Kaboom absolutely covered himself in explosives, a suicide bomber that could cut out the suicide bit entirely. As soon as he felt himself being pulled into the air, he detonated the entire city block he was in. If Tan hadn't evacuated the area a few minutes before, about a hundred people would be dead right now. Librarian was knocked unconscious from the blast, and Avalanche is still reconstituting himself. Tan flew off in pursuit of Kaboom, all the while evacuating civilians, making his warnings carry through the air to everyone within a mile radius. Railgun has her own problems to deal with, strafing the city, remotely disabling every explosive she can find. She's on her way here. Five minutes out. But there's only three and a half minutes left on the timer on the side of the suitcase bomb that Kaboom left as he ran away, his body exploding over and over again. I was never cut out for this. Organizing people with powers, making sure the right people are talking to each other, I can do that. Alerting the people with the best chance of helping as to what's going on, I can do that. But how the hell do you disarm a bomb? I do not know. Well, that depends on the bomb in question. I recognize the voices. Avalanche and Librarian. I can still hear Librarian, even when he's unconscious. Yes. Yes. Librarian, do you know how to disarm this? Not this bomb specifically, but I think I could figure it out. My eyes flick from the timer to watch the rocks that make up Avalanche's body slowly reassemble pooling pebbles together into one central form. He can't help right now. Librarian is motionless, and the blood from his head is pouring onto the ground, staining his dress shirt a deep crimson. I should be able to stitch him up, but I don't have the time. I crawl over the suitcase. My legs still can't hold my full body weight. Two minutes, 59 seconds. Okay, Librarian. How do you disarm a bomb? Thank you, the librarian says, wincing just a little as I finish suturing his head wound. For what? Everything. No, she won't respond as well if I'm not specific. For saving my life. For saving my life, he says, a sheepish smile on his face. You're the one that knew how to disarm the bomb. Knowledge is useless if you can't properly apply it. Knowledge is useless if you can't properly apply it. I suppose mimicry is the sincerest form of flattery. I love that quote. Librarian smiles in spite of the pain and the stress and the somewhat pyrrhic victory we achieved today. I'd like to take you out to dinner, if you could bear my company. I'd like to take you out to dinner, if you could bear my company. What? Why? Because you enchant me. What does that mean? Enchant, to fill someone with delight, to charm. No, I mean, why do you want to take me out for dinner? because you are a beautiful and intelligent woman that I find remarkably pleasant to speak with. And for no other reason? I am also quite hungry. I frown, trying to figure out the right questions to ask to get the answer I'm looking for. 
Librarian's smile falters a little bit at the pause, but he still has a look of distant hope on his face. One moment. As long as you need. As long as you need. Is this a date? That was my intention, but if that is uncomfortable for you, I'm perfectly happy to simply have dinner. This isn't exactly what I was expecting. I can't help but remember Patricia Paxton's curse on me. You will always know the terrible things that others think about you. What's the worst thing you've thought about me? How do you define worst? Of course, even the librarian in my head has to answer questions with more questions, needing clarifications before he can give a proper response. Worst being something that you would think I would be unhappy to hear you say about me. I do not expect you to stay with this team. Why? Because your isolation is pathological, so much so that I believe it inhibits your life. I believe that you will needle Tawn, Avalanche, Railgun, and I for information, looking for a reason to leave because you believe that everyone you meet is doomed to think something terrible of you. I have to stop myself from stepping backward in surprise. Like I'm doing right now? Yes. And you believe that this is the wrong thing to do? Yes. Why? Because if you exclusively measure yourself with negatives, you will come to the false conclusion that you are solely composed of negatives, and that anyone with any sense will come to see that with time. Due to your ability, you would know as soon as they did. But you are not exclusively composed of terrible things. I believe you would be happier if you surround yourself with people that do not think of you negatively at all. You want me to ignore my flaws? I want you to see yourself as I see you. And how do you see me? Flawless? No. I do not know you well, but I believe you have at least one flaw. Which is? That you believe you are a fundamentally broken person. And you think I'm more than that. If I knew how to prove it to you, I would. But for right now, I am happy to be here so that you can peer into my mind and know that what I'm saying is the truth. I cock my head at him, and he raises his eyebrows. You want me to read your mind? Yes, if it will help you know that you are not exclusively terrible. Your high opinion of me could simply mean that you're blind to my faults. Then I would consider you exceptionally lucky to have found a person that thinks of you that way. Cute. I cock my head to the side, and Librarian smiles, bobbing his head a bit to a song in his head. Like jazz. Fine, then. Oh, optimist, what do you consider your worst flaw? I'm 30 years old, and I have no idea how to drive a car. I laugh. I can't help it. It's all too ridiculous. Librarian smiles a bit awkwardly. Is that a no, then? I shake my head. It's a yes, provided you choose somewhere private. I don't want to hear what everyone is thinking. Librarian beams. I'm glad I was able to convince you. 